Good afternoon and welcome to Connecticut's Old State House. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I'm the head of public programs here and I'm delighted to welcome you to the third and last in our series on the 2020 census. Today's program entitled Controversies of the 2020 Census, Who Counts? We'll look at some of the controversies that have come up during the last year of the census. Before we get started, we'd like to thank the people who have supported this program, Connecticut Humanities for their financial support of this three-part series, as well as um, our partnership with the Office of the Lieutenant Governor and the Office of the Secretary of the State. We appreciate their support of these programs. And I'd also like to thank my colleague here at Connecticut's Old State House, Mariana Garcia, for her assistance. In the two previous programs, we've explored the history of the census and how the resulting data is used to inform funding and redistricting, the, the building of schools and hospitals, and many other important decisions regionally. Today's program looks at some of the controversies that have surrounded the 2020 census, which continues to make news as we speak. Please make sure to fill out the program survey that appears in the comment section under Facebook Live and also at the end of the video description of this program. I'm delighted today to welcome back my friend, Diane Smith, who will again moderate our program. Diane Smith is a New York Times bestselling author, Emmy award-winning journalist, documentary producer, and speaker. Diane has been on the air in Connecticut for more than 25 years at WTNH TV, CPTV, the Connecticut Network, and WTIC News Talk 1080. She is currently a distinguished lecturer at the U University of New Haven. And recently, Diane was inducted into the Connecticut Journalism Hall of Fame and the National Academy of Television, Arts and Sciences Silver Circle for 25 years of distinguished service to broadcasting and the community. It is a true delight to welcome Diane to today's program. Rebecca, thank you so much. And it is really wonderful to be with you at the uh, Connecticut Democracy Center. I should start by saying that our programs at Connecticut's Old State House and the Connecticut Democracy Center frequently examine history and how history shaped our state and our nation's stories. Not often are our programs the stuff of breaking news, except for today. Our topic, Controversies of the 2020 Census, Who Counts, could not be more timely as the Supreme Court ruled Tuesday to allow the Trump administration to end the census count ahead of schedule this Thursday, October 15th. The court's ruling is just the latest turn in a roller coaster of a legal fight over the timeline for the national count. The New York Times reports that the Supreme Court order is, quote, effectively shutting down what has been the most contentious and litigated census in memory and sets the stage for a bitter fight over how to use its numbers for the apportionment of the next Congress. The national head count, of course, was halted by the pandemic for some time, and then it was restarted. Lower courts had previously ruled that census workers could keep counting through the end of October. Local governments and civil rights groups are fighting to keep the count going, but so far the word is that it will end on the 15th. So right now the Census Bureau is facing a deadline of December 31st to count, review, process, tabulate, and report 2020 census data, which is, as you know, just a short time away. Joining me now to discuss this year's census controversies is Bridget Quinn Carey. She is CEO of the Hartford Public Library. Bridget is also a member of the Connecticut Complete Count Committee. Prior to joining the Hartford Public Library in 2016, Ms. Quinn Carey held numerous leadership positions in libraries in New York, Iowa and Connecticut. She earned her BA from the State University of New York at Binghamton, go Bearcats, and her MLS and MBA from St. John's University. And by the way, Bridget, I made a donation to uh, State University of New York at Binghamton in your name last night. We are both alums of the school. So when the students called, I gave money in your name. I'm also pleased to welcome Chris George, who's the Executive Director of Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services, known uh, fondly as IRIS. It is the New Haven-based refugee resettlement agency that has welcomed more than 500 
refugees to Connecticut. Chris George began his international career in 1977 as a Peace Corps volunteer in Oman. He worked with Save the Children, mostly in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, and with American Friends Service Committee in Lebanon. Chris was executive director of Human Rights Watch Middle East. He established an emergency assistance program for Palestinian nonprofits before returning to Connecticut in 2004. Chris, welcome. And a good friend of the Connecticut Democracy Center joins us today. Bilal Siku is the Associate Professor of Politics and Government at Hillier College at the University of Hartford, where he has been teaching since 2002. His research interests are race and politics, urban politics, campaigns, elections, and voting behavior. We could do shows on all of those right now if you guys can stay for several more hours. <laughs> <laughs> Bilal sits on the board of directors of several organizations that work to promote social and political change, including CT Mirror, the Connecticut Citizen Action Group, Connecticut Center for a New Economy, and Common Cause Connecticut. And welcome, uh, all three of you. And Bilal, I'm going to start with you and ask you to explain why the Trump administration is seeking to alter the timeline for the census. Well, you know, obviously this has been something that the administration has been interested in doing for some time. And, you know, there's a lot at stake here. You know, obviously being able to go door to door and do the kind of counting that's necessary, you know, in a pandemic and also to have people who are preoccupied with just trying to survive all of this to take the time to fill out the census form really created an opportunity to uh, to really sort of undermine this entire process. I think, you know, a lot is at stake. Obviously, on other programs, you've talked a lot about some of the critical funding issues involved, $1.5 trillion annually, you know, resources that people all around the country rely on to, you know, to provide services ranging from healthcare to workforce assistance to food assistance to disability services, senior services, and so on. But I think also what's at, at stake here with the census is, you know, having an undercount, a uh, account that's not reliable also means that lots of people who should be counted, particularly people from marginalized communities, will not be counted. And I think what this, you know, the political consequence of this, of course, is that you know, congressional seats and state district lines at the, at, the, in, at the state, the local, and as well as the federal level are all counted and designed based on this process of collecting this information. I think, you know, what Trump, the Trump administration is thinking and perhaps what Republicans are thinking is that if there is an undercount, that gives them an advantage in terms of their ability to draw those district lines at the state level which will keep them in power and really work to their advantage. And I think that's a big part of the calculation of this administration. In addition to the anti-immigrant sort of uh, attitude that the administration has had from day one, ever since the president descended down that escalator and not counting them also could really undermine and jeopardize the ability of folks in blue states to get the kind of resources that they need in large urban areas where a lot of immigrants tend to settle in. Mm -hmm. And Chris, uh, I'd like to go to you because, of course, uh, uh, the whole question about immigrants is really your bailiwick with IRIS. Uh, there was uh, initially a, a push by the administration to include a question on the census about citizenship. I should mention that the Constitution, which is what orders the United States to hold the census every 10 years, says it must count everyone, everyone residing in the country. Um, however, there was a citizenship question. First of all, whose idea was that? And Tell us what happened with it. Chris, we need to unmute your microphone. The, 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 the craziness around the 2020 census began uh, way back in March of 2018 when the Commerce Secretary, Wilbur Ross, um, uh, there's no nice way to say it, lied in a congressional hearing when he said that the Justice Department wanted to have a citizenship question on the census. It turns out that wasn't true. It was Wilbur Ross's idea, probably at the behest of the Trump administration. They wanted to include um, a question on the census that asked people, you know, are you a citizen? It has been included in the past way back in 1950 was the last time there was a citizenship question on the census and everyone agreed all of the experts in the census bureau agree that that is a bad idea 
because it discourages people from answering the census or answering the questions correctly. So all of the research shows that if you want to get an accurate number, which by the way is the most important reason for doing the census, and it's what our representative democracy is based on, accurate numbers of people living in the United States, if you want to get an accurate number, you don't complicate things by asking questions that are going to decrease the accuracy. So since 1950, everyone has agreed asking citizenship is a bad idea, but it was resurrected by the Trump administration and by the Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross. It went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decided that, uh, no, this is a, uh, a contrived reason. They actually said they wanted a, sense, a, a citizenship question in order to protect voters' rights. Now, that's not something that we generally connect to the Trump administration. Um, the Supreme Court saw right through that uh, rationale and ruled in uh, 2019, just in time for the forms to be printed up, no, you cannot include a citizenship question. Mm -hmm. There are uh, experts in the Census Bureau who estimate that if you had included a citizenship question, it would probably result in uh, a drop of about 6 million uh, respondents. And of course, where are most of the um, minorities, um, undocumented immigrants, um, indigenous people living in largely democratic areas? So it was a scheme that clearly would have benefited the Republican Party. Um, but it's not over mm -hmm. because what is behind the insistence to end the counting early is the insistence to have initial results by December 31. Mm -hmm. Well, who will be president on December 31st? Even if he loses in November, it'll be Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And he will have an opportunity to use the information. The Trump administration will have an opportunity to try to use the information in a way that benefits the Republican Party. That is, say, we only want to use, to use registered or eligible voters in order to apportion the House of Representatives seat. Bridget, before I get into some of what the library has done to try to um, aid in the count, let me start by talking to you also about the immigration question or the immigrant question, because the library has been a place that um, immigrants have been able to go for a number of years now to learn um, how to become citizens, to take uh, the required education to become a citizen and even to be sworn in as a citizen. So what was your concern about a question like that on the census? Well, well, from the beginning, uh, from the beginning, you know, the census has been challenged because there's been less resources um, provided to it on a national level than there have in the past. So we we knew that there were going to be roadblocks. I don't think we we appreciated how high they would be, um, and we also knew that there were going to be trust issues in the communities because of um, the national debate around immigration. And even if people are here fully legally and, and documented, um, they're certainly on edge because of the rhetoric at a national level uh, regarding immigration and, and how welcome people are in the country. So we knew that it would be a challenge to get people to complete the census, um, regardless of their citizenship status, if they were here from other countries. So we had worked for the last couple of years to encourage people to be ready for it. Um, and when the actual forms came out to work with them on a grassroots level, to ensure that they were, um, you know, they understood the process and that they felt that it was something that they should do. So we started that, you know, years before the actual census came out. Um, but that really is the, the bottom line is it, it's trust. And I think that's why we as a, a community organization along with, with others, but certainly we feel like we're a trusted institution in the community and people know us. And we have built up this 
these relationships with people because of our citizenship work and because we are a place for all, um, that we felt like we could really be helpful going out into the community as well as welcome pe welcoming people in to mm -hmm. say, you know, the census is safe. The census is really, really important, particularly in, in urban centers like Hartford. And we want to make sure that you have accurate information and you know that this is a good thing for you to do. So, um, you know, we were poised to do that. We're, we're trying to still continue and we will do it until midnight on the 15th yeah. to get as many people to file as they possibly can. But it's been a challenge from the very, very beginning. Bridget, tell me a little bit about how the pandemic threw a monkey wrench into your plans for how you were going to do outreach as well as do uh, events within the library system. Yeah, well, one of the challenge, another one of the challenges and, and, and changes for this year is that the census for the first time was primarily, um, at least from the very beginning, an online exercise, right? So people received links rather than just a mailing with the form itself to complete. And in a place like Hartford, most homes, well, not most, I would say over 40% of households in Hartford do not have access to reliable internet service. They may have it on a mobile phone or, or things, but they don't have access and they don't have broadband access. So we knew that there would be a, a you know, an impact of the digital divide. So our plans were to have um, additional hours and you know census events where we would make sure that anybody that needed to come in and complete the census had ample opportunity and access to um, to a computer, as well as understanding how else they could complete the census by phone or or by mail, um, and also promoting the fact that the census was available and, and guidance to the census was available in many many different languages. So we had a huge you know outreach effort in all of our branches as well as with our mobile library. And all of that got abridged because of the uh, the pandemic. So, what we what we had to shift to do was to start making those outreach calls literally as calls. I mean, we've had events where we have staff people calling five customers and saying, "Hey, did you complete your census?" So the old fashioned phone okay. tree yeah. um, to get people to encourage it. So we we really had to shift our our approach dramatically. And unfortunately, I think it's had a a negative impact because we we're not seeing the the completion rate that we would like to in Hartford. Yeah. Um, before we go further, I usually uh, wait to have audience questions till um, a little further along. However, this is a good one to bring up. Don Rogers is asking for an explanation, and Bilal, maybe this is for you. Why did the lower lower federal courts order the census count to continue, and then why did the U.S. Supreme Court yesterday reverse that ruling and hold that the census count can be stopped tomorrow, October fifteenth? What was there? Um, I, I don't know if they actually had to give an explanation on that, but do you know have any idea why that was? You're, you're muted, Bilal. In some ways, I think this is the success of the uh, Mitch McConnell strategy for trying to stack the um, federal judiciary, and including the Supreme Court, with conservative justices who are much more open to the kinds of arguments that um, mm -hmm. the Republican Party is making about issues like this, right? Um, you know, the payoff of having added two Supreme Court justices to, uh, to, to the court um, really paid off in this instance in which, as this got argued through, um, the judge who ruled before, I think, was an appointment by a Democrat. Um, and now you've got a court in which, um, you know, if you get this next edition, that will be five justices who've actually been added by candidates who didn't win the popular vote, but won the Electoral College vote. And many of them are hostile to these kinds of issues. And, and they've demonstrated that through, you know, rulings that they've made in the past. And so I think in some ways, um, you know, this is really a reflection of uh, the success of that strategy of placing on the court conservatives who will rule in this in this way on these kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. um, I think with Sotomayor put together a very good argument and a dissent on this particular decision, but you know, it's it's in many ways. I just think it's a it's a payoff for a very successful strategy that's been that the Republicans have worked on for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So then, if this is the case, um, Chris, let me ask you: What's the payoff for the administration to stop the count now? Well, <clears throat> I think the Supreme Court um, 
rule that, you know, this is not really a judicial matter. I think Bilal is right. Um, the, um, the justices, uh, the majority of them thought, you know, this is a, uh, these details are really something that the, um, that the Department of Commerce can decide. They also figured, well, if the legal deadline for submitting preliminary results is December 31, then the only way to meet that is to stop the counting soon and uh, do the tabulations, do the corrections, and then get that uh, preliminary information uh, to the administration uh, by December 31. Well, the original postponed deadline would, uh, was April of 2021. Uh, and that made much more sense because it, it gave the Census Bureau much more time to do the counting, to do the calculations, and then in a very you know, well-organized, accurate way, submit the information in April. But from the Trump administration's perspective, that's not good because there could be a new president in April. And their plan is to take this information from the census and then say, we only want to count eligible voters uh, in order to apportion the um, House of Representative districts. Mm -hmm. So that is, you know, something that is probably going to be again taken to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And we'll be hearing about the framers of the Constitution and their intention when they said in the in, in the in the sixth sentence of the Constitution, uh, when they talk about the census, did they really intend for everyone, all residents, regardless of immigration status, to be counted, or did they want just eligible voters to be counted. Mm -hmm. I want to get into redistricting in a, in a minute because uh, Connecticut will be facing that now. But let me ask uh, Bridget one more question. You mentioned that um, uh, that in Hartford there is a, such a dramatic digital divide. In fact, we know that exists throughout uh, Connecticut, and that is one of the reasons why there is an undercount or, or an anticipated undercount in areas uh, like cities like Hartford, like Waterbury, uh, where there is a digital divide and people were not able to respond online. But actually, one in five Connecticut residents lives in what are considered hard to count areas. There's other reasons that make those areas hard to count besides lack of, of computer technology, isn't there, Bridget? Yeah, absolutely. There, there are a number of factors that, that go into deciding and, and um, kind of, uh, you know, creating that, that hard to count um, category, and that includes families with young children. It also includes that the age uh, between like 18 and 26, what sometimes is called opportunity youth or, or young young adults. Um, and then there's there's other factors as well. I mean, it just trends that um, happens to be um, pe black people. Um, you know, it, it, it's such a trend with folks that are generally in urban areas um, that it's you know, it, it comes down to trust in government. So all of those things that are, all of those those factors that go into creating hard to count populations for whatever reason, um, they existed before the digital divide that, that's been a, a situation for the last, you know, several census mm -hmm. counts um, has been historic. So the, the outreach efforts that we were planning and what we had to um, evolve certainly focused on those particular areas. Um, and that's, you know, one of the, the, the places that we've come up short and that we see when you track the return rates, it, it does continue that trend that those are the, the populations that unfortunately will be undercounted. They will be underrepresented in the census figures uh, for our state and across the country. And that's, um, that's just really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And I should mention that um, it, beyond uh, Connecticut's bigger cities like Hartford, Waterbury, Bridgeport, uh, there also is a, a, a concern of undercount 
in some of the much more rural areas, uh, particularly eastern and northeastern Connecticut, there's a concern there that uh, people are hard to count in part, again, because of a digital divide, because there's not great uh, as good bandwidth in some cases, and also for other reasons, for people not having access to transportation and um, and access to other things that would make it more possible for them to get to places um, where they could actually participate. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about political representation. Um, Bilal, the, uh, Every 10 years, as a result of census, um, Connecticut is required to uh, redistrict. And that always leads to all kinds of fights, even though it's supposed to be bipartisan. It gets very political. Last time, I think 10 years ago, they had to, um, they had to actually bring in a mediator because the parties couldn't agree. But Connecticut lost a congressional seat last time. Could we be in danger of losing another one this time? I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Just really quickly on a, a comment also that, that Chris raised and then and, and answer that question more directly. I think it's, you know, sort of interesting about this sort of originalist intent sort of argument that is being made about, you know, the, you know, the counting of people for purposes of representation. I mean, it's also a period in which only, you know, white men who own property were basically given the citizenship rights. And, and then we of course know about the counting of slaves with the three-fifths compromise. So these are some sort of interesting standards in terms of trying to apply you know, what was going on in the 18th century to what we're experiencing today. Mm -hmm. But I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, in many ways, this battle is really, I think really one of the central issues is about um, political representation and the way in which this data is used for purposes of you know, doing that count and, and making decisions about um, how district lines will be drawn up. I mean, um, while the Republicans have lost some ground in state legislatures and state governorships to really control that process um, in a number of states you know, over the last you know, four years, um, what we do know, though, is that whoever has control is able to draw up those lines at the federal, you know, and also at the state level. And it's been a way in which the, the Republicans have been able to sort of exercise kind of outside, outsized power within the um, states as well as in Congress. I mean, the, you know, last few congressional uh, elections, we've seen um, Democrats actually win a more a larger portion of the vote, but because of the way in the district, the way the districts are drawn up, they haven't that hasn't sort of translated into seats. And so I think you know what's at stake, and I think what the Republican Party recognizes is that it is a party that is losing ground in terms of partisanship. Um, you know the sort of Gen Z and you know and Gen X and others that are coming along are not as conservative or not as likely to be Republicans. And so this is really a, a power play to try to figure out how to hold on to power, even if it means distorting democracy in order to be able to do it. And so I think for a lot, especially uh, activist organizations and others who are pushing back against this, I think you know efforts have been you know, going on around the country to try to create nonpartisan committees that, act, that will actually do the drawing of the district boundaries, the district lines. As you know, I am, um, uh, you know, the chair of the state board of Common Cause and also a member of the National Governing Board of Common Cause. And that's been one of the issues that we've pushed across the country is to pull that decision out of the hands of politicians and put that decision into the hands of nonpartisan people who will draw these uh, district lines up in a, in a much more fair way. Mm -hmm. Let me go a little bit uh, more macro, and uh, and Chris, I'll ask you to start, and I'll ask it, actually all, all three of you to comment on this if you like, and that is that, of course, um, this also affects the Electoral College, and we have seen in just the last few years two presidents uh, elected who were um, not elected by the popular vote, and there, but by the Electoral College, and there has been a move in Connecticut and in other states like Connecticut where our Electoral College um, uh, count is not very high and not very as important as other states to do away with the Electoral College. Is this a way of, and I guess Chris, I'll start with you. Is is this census and how it's playing out a way of cementing the Electoral College in place? Well, again, um, I, I, I'd like to go back uh, for a second to um, a point that um, that Rebecca made, this issue of trust. Um, again, beginning back 
with um, the effort to put the citizenship question on the census, all of the anti-immigrant sentiment uh, spewed from the administration has really, I mean, the damage was done in a way. Um, there, I'm sure, hundreds of thousands of uh, immigrants who um, did not participate in the census because they were afraid that uh, their participation might identify them and then um, if they're undocumented, um, they could be uh, tracked down and, and deported. I mean, I work with refugees and immigrants. These are not outlandish, crazy thoughts and fears that people have. They're very real fears. So I think the damage was done. And, and I think that it's pretty safe to say that uh, this census is going to result in an undercount. Um, yes, the, the, the numbers are used. Um, to determine um, the, uh, you know, not just uh, the House of Repres uh, apportionment for the House of Representatives, but also the numbers for the Electoral College. And, you know, we have to keep reminding ourselves, this is a 10 year period that um, will, decisions during the next 10 years will be based on these numbers. Trillions and trillions of federal money allocated on the basis of these numbers. You know, it is a huge deal. A lot is riding on it. And it is a shame because this used to be a, you know, bipartisan, uh, you know, no one dares mess with the census kind of issue. But in this climate and in this world, um, it has been so badly politicized. Um, and I, you know, just, Hope we can make it through this period where uh, everything um, is, is not so badly politicized and distorted. Mm -hmm. Bridget, would you like to comment on that? Sure. I, I mean, I think the electoral college we've seen, we, you know, mm -hmm. perhaps is a flawed system. Um, but I do think that we are kind of stuck with it for a while. However, there are other ways of thinking about how elections are handled on a state level that could help with that. So, um, for example, a state like Maine, you know, they've gone to ranked mm -hmm. choice voting, um, which will be an interesting way to see, does that really um, have an impact on the uh, on the way that voting happens? And is that a better way to engage voters to ensure that there is a good turnout and that people are, in fact, um, counted more more effect, you know, their votes, their votes um, have the impact that they wanted to have. And it, it, it makes it feel like there may be a, a perhaps other ways mm -hmm. to handle voting on a state and local level um, that can re-engage a public that is so, I think, torn and, and perhaps cynical. And, and that also may impact uh, voter turnout if people are feeling disenfranchised and that their votes don't count. Um, so we don't want to continue that cycle. We want people to feel like, yes, their votes count and they are an important part of our democratic process um, and that it is critical. And um, even if you know there, we do have to face this next 10 years of challenge, how are we going to make sure that the future is better for, for generations that come up behind us and that we do have some kind of election reform regardless of what that looks like. Bridget, would you explain uh, what ranked choice voting is? You mentioned that that's uh, now what they're doing in Maine. Yes, so ranked choice voting essentially does not just um, end with the first cycle of voting. So, mm -hmm. you know, if let's say there's four candidates um, you know, that it's not just a given that, you know, if one candidate gets you know, 51 uh, percent that that's the, the winning candidate, there is an opportunity to go back and vote again. And it kind of winnows the field so that, um, you know, you maybe you would have another opportunity to vote mm -hmm. for a candidate, even if that candidate on that first round of voting, because it, it has a, a series of votes, um, is not, you know, uh, deemed in the upper in the upper percentile. So there's other countries that use this, pro have used this, this process. Mm -hmm very successfully and it does give the opportunity for parties that are looking to come up because i think there's such a, a hold too right we are we're in this two-party system that there really seems no way mm -hmm. to kind of break or to have um, any kind of third party fourth party system mm -hmm. so what it does is it just bring it raises up other voices in other ways so that it isn't um you know just so so structured in that two-party mm -hmm. system and, and creates pathways 
for other parties, for other points of view, for other candidates to have a chance. Um, and, and a voter wouldn't necessarily feel like voting for a third or fourth party candidate mm -hmm. is wasting their vote. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the power mm -hmm. of a system like that. Yeah, I do. Um, I, I do know of at least one country fairly well. Uh, my sister has lived in France for about 25 years now, and that's how they vote. And, uh, and it is very interesting. And it does, in fact, uh, do some of what you said, allow other parties to rise up. Um, Bilal, uh, Bridget mentioned, you know, people feeling um, that they're not their vote doesn't count. Why should they bother? But we've seen what seems to be a lot of excitement about voting in part because of huge efforts by people not generally associated with promoting voting. Um, what do you suspect is going to be the turnout this year, Bilal? Um, you know, my, you know, what I suspect is that the number of people who turn out for this election compared to the previous election uh, will be higher. Just how high that will go um, at this moment, I'm not certain, but I think, you know, definitely we're going to see an increase um, in, in voter turnout. Um, if any, if there's any indication or any indicator we've seen from what has happened in those states that have now opened up um, in-person voting and the long lines that we've seen in Georgia and and we're going to see in other places, I think if that's an indicator, then this is going to be a, a really big jump. Just you know, real quickly about the the ranked choice is that you know what's great about that system and also the system of preferential voting which is an which is another way of doing it as opposed to the plurality polarity a mm -hmm. plurality uh sort of winner take all system that mm -hmm. we use here in the United States is that it does give voters more choices and you can you know certainly vote for you know an alternative you know candidate from an alternative party and it does create an opportunity you know for mm -hmm. that very quickly about the the electoral college it's interesting for me because I just talked about this the other day with my elections and campaign class. And generally students really don't like the electoral college and they generally don't like it for the reasons that have been raised is that they feel like it doesn't uh, really represent the will of the people. And they, you know, in their mind, they think that their vote really doesn't count. I mean, and, and certainly when we think about the electoral college and I would throw the US Senate in, in this as well, they, um, you know, certainly are anti. They are anti-democratic uh, processes, and they were put in place by the framers, you know, for a variety of reasons related to not trusting the people to be able to make, you know, really good decisions. To um, also the way in which it reinforced the power of those slaveholding states. But certainly, what it does today is that it really does distort representation. You know, as an example, a state like Wyoming, which probably has about six hundred thousand people. They get a minimum of three uh, electoral votes. A state like California, which has 40 million plus people, they have 55. But basically what it comes down to is that they get one elector for about every 400,000 in the population, whereas Wyoming gets one elector for every 200,000. Mm -hmm. And so that really distorts democracy. And by doing an undercount, you really risk the possibility of having, you know, among that you know, 435 people, you know, who are in Congress having those, you know, shift and maybe Connecticut does lose a seat depending mm -hmm. on how other states grow and other states shrink in population. But, you know, overall, we have a very flawed system that has a quirk in it that's a really big quirk, which is that the person who loses the popular vote can actually win the election. And what happens is that because of this electoral college, and the distortion that it does, it really means that small states that are mostly rural, um, mostly white, um, mostly uh, more conservative, are able to exert more influence in, in our election system because of the Electoral College. And again, a similar analysis can be done when you think about the US Senate, probably 15 states that have about 38 million in population, all have two senators, which add up to 30 senators. California has more people in that state and they get two senators. And that just, something's wrong with our democracy that that sort of stands as the way in which we do things. Yeah, I think about uh, the comedian Bill Maher, and he's been campaigning for a long time, uh, saying that, you know, why is there a, a North and a South Dakota? Why aren't they one state? And secondly, why does a state with such a small population as a South Dakota or a Wyoming have two senators when California and New York also have two senators, which yeah. you know, does really raise a lot of a lot of issues in a more simplistic level, even than than talking about the Electoral College. Um, one of the things that that struck me also when the three of you were discussing um, district lines and all of that 
is that um, voting rights are impacted in many ways by the census. And, you know, this is a year when many people have said there is a, a strong effort uh, to suppress voting. Um, but the census is actually key to enforcing voting protections like the Voting Rights Act. Um, Bilal, would you explain um, how that works and why that's, uh, why that's connected? Sure. When, when, you know, advocates are out there and lawyers and others are really trying to fight to protect people's voting rights, which have been under attack for more than a decade now in a, in a number of states. I mean, we, we look at what Abbott has done in Texas with this idea of one sort of absentee ballot box per county. I mean, one county in Texas is actually 500 miles larger than the state of Connecticut and five times the size of Delaware just outrageous. And there are certainly efforts to suppress the vote that go on. For lawyers and advocates who really attempt to prove, for example, that you know these kinds of activities are going on, to prove discrimination when it comes to voting, having access to this data is really critical. This demographic data is the kind of data that they bring in to prove, for example, that efforts are being made to suppress the Black vote by, for example, closing polling locations, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so this is just really critical kinds of information and for communities of color, indigenous people who are living on reservations, for people uh, you know, who are living in communities and urban areas, people who are experiencing homelessness, for example, counting them and trying to figure out ways to protect their voting rights, this census data is critical to the people, the advocates and the, uh, and the other folks who are out there trying to make that happen. And so, you know, this undercount, I think, will go a long way towards undermining voting rights as well as vote, undermining civil rights protections that also often can rely on mm -hmm. the collection of this kind of information. Mm -hmm. Your mention about um, closing some polling places um, struck me when I was saying a few minutes ago about people getting involved and getting out the vote who normally are not involved, even people um, who have never voted before. And I thought about this when I saw Shaquille O'Neal very involved in a get out the vote campaign and mm -hmm. said, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I'm registering to vote for the first time in my life. And he's in his 50s, I believe. Um, but I think that the move by LeBron James and others in the NBA to get um, uh, arenas to be opened up as large polling places mm -hmm. is very interesting. And from what I've seen in the states that have early voting seems to have made a difference. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think, you know, what you're seeing is a, a level of activism around um, this election because the president has really communicated on a number of occasions that he's willing, for example, not to accept the outcome of the election um, because he believes there's rampant voter fraud. And so you've got all kinds of organizations that are out there trying to, you know, fight back and to prepare for what can be a really chaotic uh, few weeks after the election. I mean, some states will actually do their count ahead of the election in terms of the absentee ballots, which will allow them to be able to announce the winner in their state much more quickly than say a state like Connecticut in which we won't start counting until election day. And as a result of that, it may take, you know, three or four days or more for Connecticut to know who actually won, you know, the race here in the state. Um, people on the ground in terms of recruiting poll monitors and recruiting people, uh, recruiting lawyers. I mean, all of these things are going on and they're going on on both sides. I mean, I think, you know, certainly the, the president and the Republican Party have basically uh, broadcast that they are going to challenge the results of this election. They're going to challenge the way in which absentee ballots have been counted. And so this is gonna be a, a chaotic moment. And of course, we all have been wondering aloud, you know, whether the president if, will accept the outcome of the election and leave the White House. So there's been a lot of discussion about what that scenario looks like if he say refuses on in January to actually exit the place. And so um, there's a lot at stake right now. And the census is a part of you know, this conflict in a society that has grown hyper-partisan, um, where people have sort of drawn lines in the sand about the reality that they believe. You know, there's a lot of folks who listen to the president who believe that voter uh, fraud is rampant, though there's no evidence of, of that at all. Um, and yet that's where we're at right now in the middle of a pandemic on top of that, which has forced a lot of people to, you know, out of fear, 
to uh, use the absentee ballot process because they're scared to go into the polling places. Yeah. Chris, I want to go back to you for a minute and, and to talk a little bit about um, immigrants and their concerns about being counted. Um, in some cases, even when they are, as you said, fully documented, does that have to do with distrusting government because of the places they came from? Well, uh, that's part of it, but uh, they also listen to the president and uh, how he has vilified uh, refugees and immigrants from, from day one. Um, I had to hold a town hall meeting for all of our refugees a uh, couple of days after uh, Trump was elected because they wanted to know if he was going to follow through on his campaign promise to send all refugees back to the countries they came from. And I had to explain, you know, no, that that that's not going to happen. Um, and um, you know, so so these are not irrational fears. Um, um, and often, anti-immigrant uh, executive orders, um, even if they're challenged immediately by the courts, they can still have a uh, a stifling uh, impact on uh, on immigrants who are in the country. So if there's an effort to tighten the rules um, around uh, the public charge uh, uh, rules. Um, and uh, even though that's been challenged in the court, even though it doesn't apply to refugees, there is still this, this uh, broad impact that goes far beyond the, uh, the, the narrow uh, uh, target of the action that impacts a, a, a lot of immigrants um, uh, and, and including refugees who are invited by the State Department to come here. They are the most legal documented immigrant in the country. Even they are afraid of, um, of, their, of losing their status uh, and, and being deported. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very strange, but also interesting, and in terms of civics, very exciting time. There's something for everyone to do. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'll be spending probably about 10 days out of the next three weeks in, in Pennsylvania uh, doing uh, poll monitoring or early voter monitoring. Um, you know, we've got to get out and make sure that people are not intimidated and can vote freely. I've got two old cardboard signs on my Subaru that I drive around with and it says, don't forget to vote. They are produced by the um, Connecticut um, uh, Department of State uh, Elections Bureau. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people will look at the signs and kind of scratch their heads and say, well, who are you telling me to vote for? And I say, nobody, I'm just saying vote. Yeah. When a lot of people vote, good things will happen. We have to believe that. And it's, our obligation, it's our duty as citizens to make sure that a lot of people vote and they vote freely and that it's a fair election. And, and there's a role for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, Bridget, let me ask you about um, some of the population that you see at the libraries, in particular at the downtown branch, um, are people who are experiencing homelessness. How do you think the effort in Connecticut has been to try to count those people in the census? Yes, well, and thank you for the for, for bringing that up because when you talk about the hard to count population, um, they're hard to reach on, on so many levels, and certainly with this with the census because you're dealing with so many challenges that those people are facing. Um, so I think Connecticut has has done a good job of connecting with the organizations that do serve people ex experiencing homelessness to try to work with them um, to ensure that they're counted. Um, the census also has a way of estimating some of those numbers as well based on feedback from organizations. So while that's not their preferred way of, of working and, and doing the count, um, there is a way to provide um, a number for, for a homeless population. So, you know, it, it's, it's not it's not ideal, um, but it, but at least it's something that they're thinking about, and they they um, did have teams of people going out. But that's one of the areas that was impacted. I mean, there was not as much funding for enumerators or mm -hmm. the people that are actually out in the community 
hiring those people was also a challenge because you want to hire people in the community to do the counts of the community. Um, and the recruitment was um, a challenge because of the COVID um, pandemic. So um, just again, the level after level and, and rowback after roadblock to make this a, a challenging time. Mm -hmm. um, but just a, a note about voting as well. So the downtown library is a polling place mm -hmm. and we work very closely with the city of Hartford to make that be as easy as possible. Um, but, you know, there's still challenges with that process as well because of, you know, requirements. Do you need an ID? Do you not an ID? I mean, we still have questions from people of what ID do I need to bring with me to vote? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's some really fundamental blocks there too that we as a, a society and as a civics effort need to make sure that we're reducing the barriers to voting um, so that people feel like it's an easy process. And perhaps one silver lining out of this is there have been obviously so many efforts in so many states to make voting easier and not just have to be, you know, hours on the second Tuesday after the first Monday or the first 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 Tuesday after the first Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, of the of the of November to vote so that there is an expanded opportunity for people if they can't get to the polls or if they have you know job conflicts or they have an employer that doesn't give them time off for for voting. Mm -hmm. So I think because I am an eternal optimist that perhaps some of these things that we've put in place this year because of the pandemic that we will be able to hold on to those though so in future years and in future elections we can get to that place. Um, that you know, Chris is talking about as far as making it easy for people to vote and getting as many people out there to vote, regardless of who they vote for, just to get out there and, and have their voices. Yeah, I'd like to think that the pandemic is being transformational in some positive ways, as well as the other ways that we've experienced. Um, you know, that's such a high note. I should probably end there, but I do have another issue I really want to bring up that I think is not as well understood and is really important very, very much in, in a state like Connecticut and Bilal, that is uh, something that uh, is known as prison gerrymandering, if you will. Um, would you explain how uh, the census counts people who are incarcerated and how that affects different communities in the state? Right, you know, the, the Census Bureau basically counts incarcerated people as residents of the communities where prisons are based as opposed to um, their homes of record, right? And so, you know, even though Connecticut law declares that incarceration does not change a person's residence, right, the state does use those census uh, data for redistricting purposes. And so, in essence, what it, again, you know, this issue of how our democracy gets distorted when we do this prison-based gerrymandering where we're creating these districts and we are counting the prisoners, for example, in the state legislative districts where they're incarcerated as opposed to the communities in which they come from, um, which is what the, where their home addresses are at, it basically means that those communities in which the prisons are actually housed are, being, are, are actually receiving more representation than the communities in which these prisoners come out of. Um, you know, some states have actually change the way they, you know, do this and have actually ended this kind of prison gerrymandering. And Connecticut needs to be a state that does that. I mean, we at Common Cause have worked over a number of years to try to, you know, you know, bring Connecticut up to a point where it does what the state of New York has decided to do, which is to count the, the inmates where they actually come from, right? Um, and again, I mean, it, it, and, 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 and I think the real really critical and fundamental issue here is that, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court has basically ruled that, you know, we have a system that should be one person, one vote. And in many ways, prison-based gerrymandering violates that notion, right? That, you know, and so people, you know, are not receiving access to government and access to representation in a way um, that really reflects what should be a very basic kind of standard. And I, I really like the way in which this conversation is really linking these issues of the census to voting rights and voting participation, because you know, at the end of the day, everyone living in the United States should have the right to be counted in the 2020 census. I mean, that means every immigrant, every child, every neighbor, every student, everyone, and everyone you know who is eligible to vote should be able to vote and so and even then that eligibility i you know personally believe um should even extend to people who are in prison 
But the idea here is that, you know, citizens of the United States should have an opportunity to participate and we should be doing everything we can to ease that access. And it means also even people who are in jail, for example, being given the opportunity to vote through absentee you know, voting. And we need to be working hard to make sure that they are represented as well. You know, it's easy to see, I guess, um, if you look at uh, a map of Connecticut or if you're familiar with the communities in Connecticut, that um, if you have large prisons based in small towns like Cheshire, Enfield, uh, places like that, that then if those people that are incarcerated are counted as part of the population of those small towns and not as population of the town they came from, whether it be a big city or, or a, a smaller town somewhere else in the state, it's easy to see the big difference that that makes. Yeah. I mean, you know, most of our inmates obviously come from places like Hartford, come from places like Waterbury, Bridgeport, um, New Haven. And so um, those cities are, you know, being underrepresented because of this, you know, quirk and the way we count them for purposes of representation when we're drawing legislative lines. And certainly for um, the senator that represents the infield area, this has been a battle that he has waged year after year, whatever there's been an effort to try to reform the system and he's been very successful at pushing back against that kind of change. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just something that needs to happen. I think we need to look in a very sort of basic and fundamental way at you know the way our political system work and I think works. And I think we need to be willing to make some changes that make sense to bring us into the 21st century. Well, I'm going to take that as a final statement from you. Um, Chris and Bridget, I'd like to give each of you a chance to make a, a closing <laughs> Statement. Bridget, how about if you're next? Yeah, so, um, you know, thank you for doing this program today. I think it's important to shine a light on what the issues are around the census and how that impacts, you know, so many other um, components of our civic life um, and how we engage and how we support the democracy that is so important to the, the fundamental, um, you know, underpinning of, of this country. And organizations and academic institutions and, and places um, like libraries are really important to ensuring that there is civic engagement. And that's what we're here for, is to give people the opportunity to learn about our civic institutions and be part of them. And so we will continue to do that and continue to encourage people to be engaged and to keep sharing information about how that's possible. So thank you. Thank you. And Chris, a final thought before you uh, jump into Subaru and head for Pennsylvania? <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I I work with refugees now. Um, prior to this, I, I worked overseas. I actually worked on a democracy program in the Middle East, a legislative strengthening program. Um, and um, I often referred to how we do things here in the United States um, when I was talking with um, infant uh, legislatures on how they might want to do things there. Um, the U.S. in many ways uh, uh, has been a model, should be a model, uh, but I think this discussion has pointed out that um, we, we don't always get things right. Um, refugees come to this country for, for our freedoms, for liberties, and for our democracy. And I cringe when I hear things um, coming out of Washington uh, like, well, I'm not so sure I'm going to accept uh, the results of this election. I mean, my gosh what has become of this country if the president of the United States is not sure he's going to result, he's going to accept the results of the election. So I think this is a wake up call for all of us. I think uh, we have got to find a silver lining. And, and I think part of it is that, you know, boom, boom, we are being shaken into a consciousness uh, that maybe we didn't have before. And we've got to be more active. We have to pay attention to our government, how it works, and uh, we need to make the reforms that are necessary. Well, thank you. I want to thank all three of our panelists and thank you for um, each ending on an optimistic note. Uh, Chris George is the executive director of IRIS. Uh, Bridget Quinn Carey is CEO of the Hartford Public Library and a member of the Connecticut Complete Count Committee. And Bilal Siku, who is an associate professor of politics and government at University of Hartford, as well as uh, head of Common Cause here in Connecticut. I thank you all so much. And I turn the program now back to Rebecca Tabor Conover.
Thank you, Diane, so much for a great conversation with our speakers. And I'd like to thank all of the speakers who joined us in the course of the three programs that we have uh, had on the census. It's been a really fascinating discussion. <clears throat> in conclusion, I just wanted to remind everyone to please remember to fill out the survey about this program, um, as we do appreciate your feedback and we do like to share it with our funders. We want to invite you to join us um, for upcoming programs here with Connecticut's Old State House. If you feel like baking, uh, do join in the Election Day Just Got Sweet Election Day virtual contest, which we will be going on until October the 26th. And you can look for information about, um, about the uh, rules um, on our website and on Facebook page. The entries are all due by Monday the 26th. Um, it is, since we're virtual, it will be uh, based on images you send in. We won't be able to taste your cake, unfortunately. The cakes must be nonpartisan, and um, you can submit them to your uh, to this email, ConnecticutDemocracyCenter at gmail.com. You can contact at the Old State House for more information. Tomorrow, feel free to join us for uh, a program entitled Encounters, which will be from suffrage to election. This is a joint uh, program that we're offering with many partners um, in the Encounter family, but it's a discussion-based uh, program. And you can look on our Facebook page for information about registering for that. And then of course, if you feel like getting out and enjoying this gorgeous fall weather through the end of October, we will still be hosting the farmer's market here at Connecticut's Old State House. We just ask that you please wear a face mask and observe social distancing. The market takes place on Tuesdays and Fridays from 10 to 2 p.m. And I just want to thank all of you for joining us today. If you missed the first two programs, you can check out the Connecticut Old State House YouTube channel, and also the programs will be on the Connecticut Network. So we invite you to enjoy them uh, as well. Thank you all for being with us today, and have a great afternoon. <laughs>